Thank you all for your interest in FlexPlot, and thank you for joining me today. Uh, forgive the audio, I am recording in a hotel room right now, but hopefully it is intelligible enough for you to understand. Uh, first of all, I'd like to thank my collaborators, uh, Gabrielle Longo, Polly Tremule, and Michael Correll for their assistance in this project. I really appreciate them. All right, so in this presentation, I'm going to argue that we should be much more graphically focused. Now, why should we be graphically focused? Well, there are several reasons. One is that humans were designed to detect visual patterns. Half of our brain is devoted to visual processing. We're good at it. So why not leverage that strength? Second, information presented graphically is often much more easier to interpret than text-based information much more easy to encode and that sort of thing. Third, we are often very good at remembering images, but not so good at remembering text. And finally, Tukey said so, and that guy was basically brilliant, so we should all listen to him. And yet, what do we find published in APA journals? Lots and lots of text and tables. So you might be thinking to yourself, WTF, why the focus on text? Why is nobody talking about graphics? That is a good question. And I'm, I suspect that there are two reasons graphics are not used more frequently. First is that there are very few rules for what makes a good graphic. So just like uh, the use of text, graphics can be easily abused and they can be highly misleading. And so maybe conscientious researchers out there are worried about being misleading in some way. But I think more importantly is that the software options are limited. For those who use like SPSS and SAS, the graphics look like they were constructed on an Atari. On the other hand, um, if you want good graphics, you could use R, but R has a ridiculously steep learning curve that is a little too steep for some people to manage. And so they resort to just using tables. And in this video, I hope to address both limitations by introducing FlexPlot. So FlexPlot is both an approach to plotting, but it's also a software package. And the guiding philosophy behind FlexPlot is this. Intellectual resources are limited. The more resources we spend constructing the graphic, or deciding the appropriate graphic to use, the less resources we have to actually interpret the graphic. But with FlexPlot, the decision making, or a lot of the decision making, is handled by the computer, which frees the researcher, the uh, frees the resources that the researcher has to interpret the results, which is where they should be spending their resources anyway. Now, how does it do this? Well, with FlexPlot, all the user has to do is specify an outcome and one or more predictors. And sometimes they may want to panel things, so they might have to choose what variables get paneled. And then FlexPlot then from there decides how best to display the graphic. So let's look at some examples. I'm just going to go through these quickly without demonstrating how they are to be done, just because I have a separate video that shows you exactly how to do these sorts of things. So histograms. So here we told FlexPlot we wanted to look at the distribution of missions and it knew that it was a numeric variable and so it knew to do a histogram. And it was also smart enough in this occasion that it recognized that we handed it a categorical variable so it did a bar chart. And then here we are supplying it with a um, categorical predictor variable like with a t-test or an ANOVA and it knew to do what I call here a median dot plot, where the raw data are displayed, which we'll talk about here in a few minutes. Or let's say you specify a numeric predictor, motivation in this case. Uh, FlexPlot is smart enough to know that, hey, I should be doing a scatter plot here. But also, FlexPlot also has a f flexibility to do nonlinear relationships. In this case, this was a lowest line. Also, uh, FlexPlot, if you supply it with a categorical and a numeric predictor like you do in ANCOVA, you have some options here. But there are various options that you could choose from, and FlexPlot is making a lot of the 
um, graphics possible in the background and just displaying this information graphically. So here are just two examples of what you could display using Flexplot. Or if you're doing a factorial ANOVA, um, here's one example where you can decide the panel on gender, so males in one panel, females in another panel, or you could decide to do them in the same panel. And doing this sort of stuff is extremely easy with Flexplot. It's just a matter of pointing, clicking, and dragging, or clicking on the arrows, however you choose to do it. Or if you're going to do a multiple regression, again, Flexplot is smart enough to know how to display the information. Now, granted, this is a lot of information at once, and we're going to, as we talk about the heuristics, uh, we're going to show you different strategies we can use to make this easier to interpret. But Flexplot, in this case, is paneling both on interests in the columns and on communication in the rows. So notice that with each of these graphics and each of the boxes that showed you the input that was required to generate those graphics, the user only needs to specify the outcome and the predictors and sometimes the paneling. And then the software does the rest. And all along the way, in the background, Flexplot is following eight plotting heuristics. And here are the heuristics. I'm not going to um, read them because you can do that yourself. And I'm going to talk about each of these one at a time. So first, the graphics should match the analysis. So graphics are really a visual representation of what the statistics is doing in the background. And because of that, they really ought to match. So in this example, um, I am showing a bad graphic where somebody is looking at the relationship between uh, treatment or um, the orientation of their therapist and their depression. And what they have done statistically is they have controlled for socioeconomic status in the background, but it's nowhere on here. And so they're just plotting the raw means of these two things. And so if they were to report in their text the results of the ANCOVA, maybe the humanist mean is 36, the psychodynamic mean is 23, and Cohen's D is 1.18 and P is less than 0.05, you might be looking at the graphic and saying, what? That doesn't look like it's statistically significant. That doesn't look like a Cohen's D of 1.1. And you might even be as nitpicky as looking at the mean here and saying, okay, that's 23. That value is, oh, I'm sorry, that value is nowhere near 23. It's more like 30. They're both 30. What's going on here? Well, that's because the graphic doesn't match the analysis. What would be more appropriate is doing something like this, which is a added variable plot with some modifications that I've made to Flexplot just to preserve the scale of the data. And so this is a visual representation of exactly what's happening in the background. So what I did was I built a model that predicted depression from socioeconomic status residualized it and then added the mean back into the score and now I'm looking at the uh, mean difference between humanist and di psychodynamic. Now it's not perfect but this is the best representation, the best visual representation I can think of of what an ANCOVA is doing in the background and now you you look at this and you can say okay I can see that P is less than 0.05 here, I can see that Cohen's D is 1.18 you might be looking at the psychodynamic mean and seeing that that's 23, but that mean is above 25, so it can't be 23. And you're right, that's again because this is an approximation of what these statistics is doing. It's not perfect, um, but it's, at least it's not way off. Uh, so that was the first heuristic. The second is that raw data are preferred over summaries. And the reason why we prefer raw data is because they highlight uncertainty they provide clues about whether our model is appropriate or not, and they preserve the scale of the outcome variable. So on the left here, we have a graphic that looks fine, it looks believable, and yet once we overlay, overlay the raw data, we see that the only reason group A has a higher mean than group B is because of that one outlier. Otherwise, there's a whole lot of overlap going on. There's really no differences between the two groups. And so that's one example where raw data shows us a lot more information than we would find just by plotting the summaries. And let me give you another example. So here we have, again, group A, group B, very misleading visual because, well, for one, the mean of group A falls at a place where there are zero scores because it's bimodal. And so this is a very deceptive graph, but if you overlay the raw data, it's not deceptive. It's very open and it's very transparent. Number three, we minimize overlap. So raw data, anytime you add raw data, 
because one of the concerns with adding raw data is now there's a lot more to look at, so it can increase cognitive load. And so here's an example where there is a whole lot of cognitive load going on. There's so much overlap, it's really hard to see what's going on. And so if we were to panel it, separate them into different groups, it eliminates the overlap between groups and it makes it much easier to see the patterns emerge. And what we did was we actually presented this to participants and asked them a bunch of um, kind of fact-based questions about the relationships and scored them both under both when the heuristic was violated and when the heuristic was followed and what we found here's a graphic that shows of course i'm going to show a graphic but uh the y-axis is the difference score or the improvement when the heuristic was followed relative to when the heuristic was violated so positive scores mean that they did better when the heuristic was followed and not surprisingly to me at least most people did way better when the heuristic was followed. And Cohen's D for this was 0.92. Number four, we want to minimize eye travel. So the further the eyes have to travel to make comparisons, the harder it is to actually do the comparison. But when we start paneling to minimize overlap, we now have to compare across panels. So for example, if I were to ask you whether the placebo is steeper than the treatment B or whether treatment B is steeper than placebo, you might be able to guess it, but it's going to take a little bit of effort to be able to figure out which one it is. Um, so with paneling, it's, it's impossible to avoid the fact that we're going to have to, our eye is going to travel far. Or is it? And that's where ghost lines come in. So what a ghost line is, is it shows the relationship between, in this case, X and Y, what it does is it repeats a relationship from one panel across the other panels. So here we are displaying the relationship between X and Y for treatment B across the other panels. And so now it's very easy to compare treatment A to treatment B and see that treatment A has a uh, not, a, not as steep of a line as treatment B, whereas in the placebo group, the, the treatment, I'm sorry, the the effect there's a stronger relationship between the two so that's what ghost lines are very helpful for making those sorts of comparisons and i would like to thank mario kart for that idea and the line for those of you who have had a ghost racer in mario kart you know what i'm talking about that's where the idea came from number five the scale of the y-axis should equal the scale of the data now this will happen naturally if we overlay raw data Otherwise, we may exaggerate group differences. So for example, here is a graph that looks like we have a pretty massive treatment effect. And yet, once we overlay the, the raw data, relative to the scale of the data, the difference is actually really tiny. So the graphic on the left is kind of misleading. Number six, we plot non-parametric fits first. So parametric visuals so for example a regression line is a parametric fit or a mean and a dot plot is a parametric fit these these may trick us into believing that the data are behaved when they're actually not so just as an example if i were to show you this graphic and if you weren't primed to be tricked as i've been doing you for the last 10 minutes or so you might just say, oh, cool, there's a positive linear relationship between the two, not realizing that lurking beneath there's actually a nonlinear relationship going on here that the lowest line here captured. And if you hadn't started with this line and just started with this line, you may not have caught it. And so that's why we prefer to do non-parametric visuals first. And by the way, if uh, the non-parametric looks very similar to the parametric, then go with the parametric fit because it makes things a lot easier down the road. And then number seven, sort nominal variables by size. So when you sort on the x-axis according to size, it displays both the category and the order without having to alter the axis. So you're doubling the amount of information, and by so doing, you also reduce encoding time. And so this is a heuristic that we tested where we asked students, based on this graph, how many more Democrats are there than Libertarians? Is it two times, three times, four times, or five times? And um, it's kind of hard to do. And by the way, we also told participants that you are being timed. 
So we showed them the graphic on the left, but we also showed them the graphic on the right. Of course, we changed the categories so they're not, um, so we don't have practice effects or anything like that. And the actual answer ends up being five times. And what we found is that when the categories were sorted, again, positive scores here means that they did better with the heuristic followed. But when the categories were sorted, uh, people were a lot more accurate than they were when they weren't sorted. And that Cohen's D there is 0.89. And then finally, the eighth heuristic for multivariate relationships, never plot just one graphic. So let's say we have the following model. We've got depression is equal to stress plus treatment. So we've got an ANCOVA going on here. But we have two independent variables. We've got stress and treatment. So do we put stress on the x-axis or treatment? Or should we panel one of the variables or put it on the same plot? Should we residualize and get an added variable plot or should we not residualize? See, each of these decisions is going to give you a different view of the data. And that view is going to condense some information and highlight some other information about the data. And because of this, it is best to plot the data multiple ways so that you can see the whole picture. So I'm going to show you four graphs that look at the exact same relationship, just in four different ways. So here we have, um, we are um, subtracting the out, out the effect of treatment and then look in the relationship between stress and depression. And we find there's a curvilinear relationship. That's interesting. And the next one, we actually residualize the effect of stress and look at treatment. And we find that once you remove stress, uh, humanist or clients with the humanist therapist are more depressed than those with a psychodynamic therapist. In this one, we are looking at the relationship between stress and depression as a function of the orientation of the therapist. And it looks like for clients of humanist therapists, the relationship is curvilinear, but for psychodynamic therapists, it is not curvilinear. It's actually a stronger relationship and it's, you know, positive. And then finally, here, instead of paneling based on treatment, we are paneling based on stress, and we see that there is a strong interaction effect going on here, such that if you are low in stress, you're much better off with a psychodynamic therapist than you are with a humanist therapist. On the other hand, if you're really stressed out, then you're probably going to be better with a humanist therapist than you are with a psychodynamic therapist. So each of these plots give us a different view, and all of them are right. They're just one piece of the picture, and that's why it's important to plot more than one graphic. And fortunately for you, Flexplot automatically follows the heuristics where possible. So you might be asking, where do I find Flexplot? Well, there are two and three quarter locations. One is in R through the Pfeiffer package. Two is in Jamovi through GlynMod. Um, this was just released uh, a day or two ago. Um, so if you download Jamovi and install the module called GlynMod, you will have Flexplot. Now in a future release, I'm going to change the name to Flexplot. Um, so depending on when you download Jamovi and download the module, it may be either Flexplot or GlynMod. And in the future, I'm not quite there yet. I have the module developed for JASP. It's just not publicly available. So, um, as you know, you can find a video of this presentation, that's what this is, on my channel. You can also see a video that demonstrates Flexplot and Jamovi, and also I have several videos that, demonstrates, that demonstrate Flexplot in R. So with that, thank you all for tuning in. I hope this has been beneficial to, see you, to help you see some of the strengths of Flexplot some of the rationale behind it, some of the empirical evidence behind it, and stay tuned because we are just in the pilot stages of collecting data. We will have much more experimental evidence to follow. So with that, I will see you next time.